I'm ISIS Chemical Business Deputy Editor Will Beecham and I'm here with Paul Hodges from International Echem. Hello Paul. Hello Will. Hi. Paul, uh, you, you've written us uh, an Outlook piece for 2016 on chemical markets mm -hmm. and um, one of your central theses is that um, as central bank stimulus is winding down or coming to an end, we're going to get a return to what you call real pricing in chemical and oil and commodity markets. What, what does that actually mean What's that, and what does that mean for chemical prices do you think? Thank you, Will. What it means is we're going to go back to the fundamental purpose of markets, which is price discovery. So I want to buy something, you want to sell it, and we negotiate between us to find out what that's really worth to me and to you. And the reason this is different from the past two or three years is that in the past, the central banks with their stimulus programs have created literally tidal waves of lending. You know, we're looking at something like $35 trillion dollars of lending over the last five or six years in total, which means that our values became inflated because it's a game of pass the parcel. I'm going to buy it from you, I pay a bit higher price, but tomorrow I can sell it to someone else. Now, when that bubble ends, and you and I have discussed this quite a bit in our interviews, the result is that the balloon deflates. And we've seen that in China, in 2015 with the stock market halving uh, we've seen the oil price going down 60 percent uh, we've seen the US dollar value rising quite dramatically uh, 20 percent or so and we've also and this is critically important we've seen world interest rates outside of those controlled by the central banks in other words the ones that you and I really use for our business those interest rates have risen 15 20 percent some of them have doubled so the market is now starting to price according to the fundamentals of supply and demand again. And if you paid too much in the past, you can't pass the parcel on to anyone else. Now this is a pretty turbulent and volatile time, and I don't think it's going to be very pleasant. You know, we've already seen quite a lot of unpleasantness, and that, I think, I fear, is just going to be a forerunner. Okay. Um, in terms of oil price forecasts, are you prepared to uh, go on the record for... 2016? Well, I think, uh, Will, I will go exactly where I've been all along, which is we're going to go back to the historical levels of oil prices around the 25 or $30. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've come down a long way since I first made that forecast. As you know, we were over 100. Uh, we made the call in the blog in August last year that it was now all about to happen. Prices are down 60% from there. So I think, yeah, there's a pretty good chance we're going to end up where I thought we always should do. And that will deflate uh, chemical prices too, I guess. Yeah, and that doesn't matter really. Uh, I mean, the, the crucial thing is that lower oil prices are actually a good thing for the chemical industry because our customers then don't have to spend so much on uh, heating and cooling their homes or on driving to work or driving the kids around and so on. So they've got a bit more discretionary cash. So in principle, lower oil prices are very good news. Of course, they're not good news, and this is a, a real uh, sadness, not good news for people who believe that for some reason oil prices were going to be higher relative to natural gas than they'd ever been in the past. So there's been a lot of investment, in, which I'm afraid, is going to be wasted. And that's one of the things I talk about in the, uh, in, in the outlook, that I think boards are going to have to look very seriously at this and say, do we really think that oil is going to command a price premium to natural gas? And if not, well, it's much better to cut your losses than to plough on. So, Paul, what kind of levels of demand growth can we expect to see in the, for the chemical sector this year? Well, I think in the general picture is going to be, I'm afraid, uh, fairly slow growth. If you look at world trade growth, for example, which is a pretty good proxy for chemicals growth, then we see that's becoming fairly flat. Now, people are finding it very difficult to get new trade agreements and so on going. And if we take the individual regions, then we can see in China, for example, that growth in the traditional sectors has slowed dramatically. I mean, there's no need to believe the GDP figures, they're obviously fictional. Uh, but in what you're seeing is probably zero growth in the old style export focused industry. And on the other hand, very strong growth in the service led uh, industry based on the mobile internet. But of course that doesn't use necessarily a lot of chemicals or polymers. So not as much use to the industry as such. 
Uh, we look broader, therefore, what that means is we're going to have a vast surplus of product around Asia. We're going to have a vast surplus of product in the Middle East. Uh, oil prices have crashed, therefore, all those commodity price uh, com commodity priced um, exporters. You look at Brazil, I was there uh, at the back end of last year. Uh, the finance minister was sharing a platform with me and talked about crisis, crisis, crisis all the time. Same in, in, in Africa, Southern Africa, uh, same in Australia. So uh, we see a lot of negatives and headwinds, really. It doesn't mean there won't be some growth uh, around, but I think it's going to have to turn over quite a few stones in order to find where the real gems are. Okay. And to what extent do demographics play a role in, in that demand growth? Well, this is, this is really just the, the heart of the question, that uh, the central bank said we were wrong when we talked about demographics. No, no, they said we can do these major stimulus programmes, that will create growth. Our argument has been very simple. Two things have happened. Thanks to the chemical and pharma industry, we now have a generation of people living for the first time for 20 years once they get to the age of 65. So we have a billion people, a billion people moving into the over 55 age group by the 2030. This has never happened before in history. If we go back 50 years, people got to 65 or so and then they died. If you go back 100 years, they died at 50. So suddenly we've got this wholly new generation. But of course, they are people who already own most of what they need and they're moving into retirement, so they're having to live on a pension instead of on, a, uh, on, 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 on earnings. So their demand is going to go down and their incomes. Secondly, because life expectancy has increased, so we haven't had so many children being born. In the Western wealthy world, replacement levels of uh, of babies 2.1 we've been below that now for 45 years since 1970 women have been having much less than 2.1 babies per per woman what does that mean it means we don't have a flood of new babies and young people coming into that critical wealth creator 25 to 54 age group so it's a very clear picture and one that we're talking about very much in the study obviously very very good news that people are going to be living for another 20 or so years compared to their grandparents but on the other hand very little growth means we've got to be very much cleverer about how we manage and businesses instead of being product focused have got to become much more service focused put a service package around the business which some people are already doing quite successfully you know, I was just going to ask you you, talk, you talked about possible gems of growth mm. um, how can chemical companies thrive in this low growth environment then? Well I think the the crucial thing is that they need to refocus as we are writing in the study and as we're suggesting on needs and not wants. So you can say oh I want a new iPhone but you don't actually need it. However you do need food, water, shelter, mobility and we do need sustainability. So can we put together packages, offerings a bit of service with expertise and a product that means meets those needs. Think of the dramatic changes that are taking place in the car market, for example. The world is not going to be selling vast numbers of new cars in the future. You know, the average car is very expensive, the insurance is very expensive, and it's only used for an hour a day. A complete waste of resources. So we've got new business models from car sharing through to um, Uber and things like that right into much more efficient uh, forms of transport through uh, uh, self-driving vehicles, plus, of course, a whole explosion taking place in public transport, one way or another. So these are the areas. And mobility, we always have a need for mobility, but we don't have a need for cars. Some people love cars, that's fine, but the majority of people, they just want to get from A to B. And, of course, younger people, who might be the ones who want to buy, are the people who are most saying, look, this is environmentally awful and I don't need to drive to meet up my, with my friends. I've got social media. So if you talk to the car companies, they tell you that key motive for this crucial generation just isn't there. OK, so, so if I'm a chemical company and I'm, I'm seeking to develop a strategy for growth for the next five to ten years, what, what's the best way forward for me? Well, this is exactly the topic that we're tackling in the study. 
what are the key strategies that you need to adopt and the the critical thing is that this is just a, a turning point in the world. I mean, last, last year when we were talking, I said the world is reaching a tipping point now and it's the end of stimulus, it's this great unwinding of stimulus and we're moving forward into a new era. Now you can hang on to thinking, oh don't worry, uh, Janet Yellen and Mario Draghi and Kuroda San in Japan and so on, don't worry that they'll manage another bout of stimulus. Maybe they will, but will that really do any better than the last lot? Probably not. Or you can bite the bullet and say, look, we really have to get much closer to our customers. There's a great example in the US auto industry. In the last four or five years, the plastics industry should have done fantastically well in the US auto industry because there's been a whole governmental-led move towards lightweight and greater fuel efficiency. But we didn't. We didn't put the people on the ground with the customers and the steel companies, the metal companies and the glass companies did. And they have eaten our lunch. And so instead of polymer consumption in the average car rising, as it had been before 2009, it's actually been declining. People are instead using high, uh, uh, high, 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 higher forms of steel and gorilla glass and so on. Now, this is a wake-up call. For the industry. We have to put people on the ground, we have to talk to our customers and we have to really focus on what can we do to meet the needs because if the steel industry can do this and beat us in our home game this is really a wake-up call and, but it shows uh, if they can do it what we could do if we applied ourselves in the same way. This is how we used to grow the business. We didn't just rely on having a central customer service department and sending out emails announcing price increases. We got down and dirty and we crawled under the, the, uh, the, the, the laboratories and so on and in the factories and we said, oh, wait a minute, we can help you do this better. And people paid us good money for doing that. That's what we get back to. And I think that's great. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you, Will.